Hello everybody. So we're talking about tree assessment and risk management today. And so let's kind of go over some of the basics. So when we're talking about tree risk assessment, what we're saying is a process of evaluating the likelihood that part or all of a tree will fail and cause damage or injury. And the second part, even though it seems um, pretty obvious, is actually really important um, because the idea of it causing damage or injury really um, creates the risk. If if there isn't a way that it's going to cause damage or injury, then there's no risk and then it's not actually something that we're too worried about. So there has to be that second part where not only is it that the tree is going to fail in some way, whether that's a, a branch falling over or that's the whole tree going down or whatever it is, but also that it's going to cause damage or injury to something. In terms of our goal, when we're thinking about tree risk assessment, our goal is to enhance public safety or protect workers on the site, uh, promote tree longevity. It's it's basically all about the idea of safety and being that we, we know we need trees uh, to help us provide uh, beautiful aesthetics, to help us provide oxygen, to help us provide shade, to to um to just enhance uh our our area but in making them an enhancement of our area we really want them to be safe and really want it to be a thing that it's not um it's not problematic for us uh so in in understanding that we really got to get to this idea that we're going to um, get to an acceptable level of risk we can't uh usually eliminate risk sometimes we have to just come down to an acceptable level of risk and as arborists our job is to provide all the information so that the property owner or manager can make that final determination of what is the acceptable risk that they're willing to have and so um, with uh, basic risk assessment there's uh, three factors so we want to worry about the potential for tree failure whether that's uh, branches or the whole tree in this picture that we have here the worry would be what what about this branch that hangs over this uh this bike path how how does that work is that is this how long is that going to be there is it good is it stable or is that something we have to worry about at some time uh the environment that may contribute to failure so uh, notice in looking at this picture again that if you look carefully enough at the at the uh, root collar of the tree or the or the the bottom of the trunk, you'll see that it's actually on a little bit of a slope. So, um, do we have to think about any sort of uh, erosion issues or with the or with the um, water nearby? Is there a possibility of flooding issues that could cause um, any sort of damage in our in our roots? Is this an area that gets a, a high amount of of lightning or anything else that might um, cause, or uh, in an area where hurricanes or tornadoes are are problematic. So just all the different parts of the environment that might possibly contribute. Um, another thing to think about because of where, just looking at this picture and thinking about where it is, something like is this an area that um, is inhabited by beavers? Because uh, you know, if beavers can get into that, that tree's probably that tree's a little big for beavers in terms of what they're looking for. But some of those trees behind it, some of those smaller ones, are perfect for what um, beavers are looking for and and dealing with uh, the issues of of beavers and them digging into trees. So all, thinking about all the different um, parts of the environment. And then the target, and what we mean by the target is the people or property that would be damaged or injured if the tree failed. Now, this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier. If there's no target, there's no risk. So if there's no bike path right here, and um, this area is just kind of set up for looks, and nobody's supposed to walk through it and all that, you're not really as worried. And, and it's not a big thing if that tree drops a branch or if that tree falls down, but because that branch... Uh, um, is right over the bike path and if this tree were to fall and fall right on the bike path there is um, there is a worry that we could we could hurt somebody or or um, cause damage um, maybe to this road so it's those sorts of things that we want to think about when we're doing risk assessment but it's really important to understand that we need to look at at all three of those the potential for tree failure the environment that um, could contribute to the failure and the target and if there's no target there's no risk so 
Um, also looking at our risk assessment basics, we want to think about the idea of failure potential and what does that mean? And failure potential is the likelihood that an entire uh, tree or part of a tree will break and fall within some given period of time. And so if we're evaluating failure potential and we, um, we really want to kind of look at everything, we want to look at the species, the growth habit, uh, any defects that we might be able to see, the quality of branch attachments. Do we have good branch attachments? Are they, are they solid? Do, are we getting good compartmentalization if we do any pruning? Uh, the condition of the root system. Do we have any lean in our tree? The history of the tree and the site. So looking at, um, looking at this picture that we have here, you know, there's a slight lean on that tree. We want to look at the root system, see how that is. We want to look at the quality of our branch attachments. You know, do we have good solid branch attachments? Do we have any co-dominant um, branches that that might have any included bark and might be might be weakened? Um, our growth habit, uh, if you start at the bottom of the tree, looks okay, but then if you look up, you start to kind of see co-dominant stems, so we know that's always going to be kind of problematic. And then just looking out for any other defects. Um, we got some dead branches up above. There's a cavity uh, down below so there's this tree has some issues and then we start thinking about what we just talked about before and we know there's a table set up right there and it's next to a little path so those are so this tree is definitely going to uh, have some risk with it and so we really want to make sure that we um, how we feel about this tree and that we give it a good examination so let me slide myself out of the way so you can just read the word tree inspection. So I've attached a, um, I've attached right here uh, this link to Purdue's extension. It talks about how to identify tree defects. So if you want to uh, pause the video, you can go into the notes and take a look at that right now. So structural defects are not always visible. In fact, uh, a, a lot of the time they won't be visible. Um, when you think about it, there's stuff that can be going inside, uh, going on inside of the tree that you don't know about and as well as things going on in the roots. So you got to learn characteristics that are associated with tree failure and just start to become comfortable um, with different things, uh, different types of species and specifically what problems those types of species may have or what specific modes of failure they have, right? Does... Um, does this tree not have a deep um, tap root? So it be it might um, if there's a big wind event, it might fall over. You know, is this uh, does this tree put out big heavy branches that um, that might um, ha have too much weight and and break off? Uh, whatever sorts of um, things you want to know about, right? Something like a a sycamore tree that's fast growing. So if it's fast growing, it's not going to put on um, it's a really heavy wood and so well, how does that affect um, growth and then what do I want to think about as the tree is growing and and what kind of uh, different ways might this tree fail if it was going to fail uh, you want to think about uh, structure and form as well right uh, what should this tree look like right is it okay it's supposed to be you know a one stem and supposed to start small at the top and taper into this perfect shape well if it doesn't look like that why doesn't it look like that and what what is different and how is that going to affect uh the tree and then any sorts of signs of decay and we'll go into uh into detail on that uh in a few slides and then you always want to use a uh, tree inspection form so that when you're doing a tree inspection, you're really um, comfortable with the idea of a routine and a process to where you try and hit every single little uh, piece of that tree to make sure that you're not missing anything. Because we'll get into uh, the idea of liability at the end of this lecture, but we want to make sure that we're doing, we're living up to our uh, duty of care. And so um, a visual tree assessment. Slide myself out of the way again let me go right here see how we'll do right there so a visual tree assessment we want to uh, look for things like dieback gaps or discoloration in the crown so start off with the crown right because that's the easiest thing to see it's supposed to be uh, like in this picture when we look here it's supposed to be a bunch of 
of healthy green leaves. So one thing that'll be really obvious to us is if that's not happening, if there's some discoloration or there's just branches when there's supposed to be leaves covering them or any big gaps in the in the crown, that's a good, easy place to start and then kind of um, maybe work our way down. So now we start looking for any lean in the tree. Uh, we want to look for any branches that extend uh, beyond the uh, beyond the rest of the crown. Is, is there anything that really um, stands out and is uh, is bigger than what it should be, or or looking different than than everything else? Then we want to keep working down the tree, and we want to look at the trunk taper. So we want to see uh, does this thing taper? Uh, is it, it does it um, go from smaller? on the trunk to bigger as we go down the tree and you can see just right here if we look at this stem specifically you can see um, some decent taper from top to to bottom which is which is always a good sign this however with all these multiple stems not as good of a sign so then uh, we from there we want to inspect the trunk the root collar the root zone and then we want to look at the tree on all sides to really make sure uh, we're not missing anything because uh, you can see on um, this picture we've got a cavity over here but um, maybe we've got some included bark or something happening over here on this side so we want to make sure that we look at all sides of the tree and and try and um, see as much as we can so um, just in case we're not comfortable with some of these terms that I just mentioned let's go over some of them so lean so this this pine right here has some some good lean to it so sometimes when we're just talking about lean we're talking about the idea of the tree growing straight but at an angle because sometimes um, due to competition or other things um, trees are trying to get themselves to the sun so maybe they do a little bit of angle this one though I'd be um, a little more uh, wary of because of the way that if I look down here at the at the roots and the root collar the way that we're uh, up up kind of out of the ground if we were sitting flat in the ground and had the same lean uh, I might be you know okay well, um, you know not too big of a deal you know that just kind of happens but seeing something like this this makes me um, hesitate and kind of think more of a uh, worry of potential for failure because of the I don't know how solid the roots are I'd probably um, want to uh, excavate a little bit of that dirt and take a look at the roots and see do we have big um, good roots and are we uh, nice you know are we are we down there or or are we you know if we get a big strong wind event could this be really problematic and because you can see here we've got a road and what looks like an intersection so if this thing goes down it's definitely going to cause uh, a big problem and be of concern so those are the types of things we want to think about with lean we'll slide over just a little bit with taper like I said before, that's the idea of seeing the tree um, at the top, like this tree right here, being uh, much skinnier in diameter and then getting bigger as we go down and even maybe a little trunk flare uh, or butt swell uh, is uh, another term for it that we, that we want to see down there at the bottom. So taper itself, having a diameter that gradually decreases from base to tip um, or or you can think about it the inverse way, having a diameter that gradually increases um, from uh, from tip to base, right? So either way you want to think about it. But the idea that we should be bigger down here in diameter than up here. Um, this the taper develops in response to wind. Uh, so if you know the tree gets used to getting kind of pushed in the wind a little bit and and develops that. Um, a little more um, rigidity and builds a little more layers down below to keep it um, to keep it sturdy in the wind. Uh, this also will get enhanced by uh, having lower lateral branches. So you'll see uh, trees have more taper or more taper and and um, be um, thicker at the bottom if they have um, branches lower on the on the stem. Uh, the big thing that's important about taper is it allows for distribution of load. So the tree can handle a lot more if it's got good taper. If it doesn't have good taper, it's not going to be able to handle um, handle um, environmental stress as well. Um, poor stems are going to lack taper. Uh, if you look at this tree right here in the background, 
If I look right here at the top, we hit those codominant stems, but from right here to right there, just looking at that tree from a distance, I don't see really good taper. So I'd be kind of worried about that tree, not to mention then the codominant stems. It's just that tree seems like it's got um, many more issues than, say, this tree right in front of us that's got some decent taper to it or or this tree over here, even though this one's got um, a branch that looks like it's almost a codominant. It's still seeing some decent taper. So with trunk flare, um, there's trunk flare and there's, um, you can call trunk flare um, butt swell as well, um, but there's also the idea of root flare. So right here, um, root flare, we can see the, um, the roots actually sticking out um, and you can see it kind of back there as well. So trunk flare is this idea that when we get our taper, that we also get that extra kind of taper right there at the base of the tree, which is good because it means we got a nice solid base to us you can think about the same thing as if you're trying to lift something up right if you're trying to lift something up you wouldn't put your two legs together and then try and bend down to get it right you'd get your your feet shoulder width apart and then you'd, you'd get down there and keep your back straight and try and pick something up the tree's the same way it's got to get its uh you know its feet its roots um spread apart so that it can have a nice solid base and so you can see a visible root flare here we don't see the root flare here so um, be a little concerned because we can see that there's not um, not that same um, trunk flare, that extra taper there at the bottom here. So it'd be a little concerning as to what's happening um, with this with this stem as opposed to these ones. And then of course codominant stems, which we mentioned before. So you know if we see something like this, where we get that included bark, and we just know that that's not a solid attachment that that's definitely going to be a weak point um, for us and so it's going to be something of concern we can see the same thing here uh, there's that included bark and included bark right there which we know makes for a weakened uh, union and we've got uh, lots of codominant branches here which means uh, lots of different ways that this can fail and a lot of different stress because the other thing to think about it is you know, if the tree has one big um, trunk and then we got that nice taper and then all the branches coming off of that, the tree can distribute that load like we talked about all throughout the tree. But now if you got like this branch going off this way and this branch going off this way and this one going off this way, and then they all got a bunch of different ones going in all sorts of different directions, that's a lot of different stress pulling in a lot of different ways. And then it starts getting hit by uh, rain or wind or whatever else that you're going on. And it's it's just a much easier for a potential of failure when you have something like codominant stems or codominant branches going on. In terms of major branches, um, branches should be smaller than the trunk diameter uh, and spaced evenly along the trunk. If we, if we want to have just what we would consider normal looking branches, we want to have them be um, smaller in diameter um, than the tree trunk. Uh, by about 50% or less. So if you look at this tree trunk, you know, this tree trunk is massive and it's got to be massive if we're going to have these ridiculously gigantic um, type of, um, of uh, branches coming off. But if you have a tree where it, the branches themselves are, are greater than 50% of the of the diameter you've got to think that the, you're probably headed um, for failure because the tree's just not strong enough to hold um, to hold that up and then the more evenly spaced uh, the branches are along the tree going back to that idea of taper and distribution of load the better off that tree is going to be and then there's also tree decay so the idea of um, of wood decay uh, we really want to look at that as a disease in a tree because uh, you, you don't maybe really um, think about it that way, but it but it is because if the tree is living and it's living with a living with a problem like decay, it's just going to be a, a problem. And really, when we're thinking about diseases, that's all they really are. They are they are problems. Um, wood decay specifically is caused by fungi. And the, the fungi are, are eating the wood. And so um, what when that happens, we call that 
rot because what the so even though the fungi are eating the wood what happens to the tree is the tree ends up rotting out like this picture right here of some nice heartwood rot so there's there's different types of rot there's basil rot if it if it's at the base of the tree there's trunk rot if it's somewhere along the um the stem of the tree root rot if it's down the roots heartwood rot like this picture right here where it's in the center of the tree or sap wood uh rot where it'd be more out here in the in the growing um tissues of the tree it'd be more on the outside there and then there's um a few uh specific types of rot um that we'll go over the first one is white rot. So um, white rot, what happens is the, the fungi are primarily decaying the lignin out of the tree. And in doing so, this reduces the stiffness of the tree. So the tree um, can't um, isn't as rigid as it would like to be. And the reason they call this white rot is because the decayed wood appears white, like we can see right here. The decayed wood appears white because what happens is lignin is darker colored. So if you eat out all the lignin of the tree, you're left with lighter colored wood. And that's why it becomes white rot. And so you got our malaria and you got uh, Ganoderma uh, species of fungi that, that um, cause white rot. We also have brown rot, uh, which you can see right here in the stem. And that happens... Um, kind of the opposite way because you have the fungi eating cellulose and because they eat um, cellulose which is lighter colored that leaves behind the darker colored lignin so then that's why it's brown rot and you have a um, a much darker uh, decay in the tree and the reason this is problematic is because it makes wood brittle and so you got uh, latiporous and phaeolus, um um, species who who are um, responsible for brown rot. There's other ones too. I mean, these are just examples. Um, you got soft rot, um, which is also going to degrade the cellulose first, and it's it's um, difficult to distinguish from the other rots because it can be um, it can be uh, very similar. Ustalina, um, Ustalina um, is an example of that as well, um, which you can see down here at the um, bottom. This is some basil rot. If we go off our um, types of rot at the beginning, because we're at the base of the tree, so this would be basil rot um, and an example of soft rot as well. And so what can maybe help us um, see decay or understand uh, decay in, in trees? So decay is a hidden defect and it's associated with a large percentage of tree failures. So we wanna look for positive indicators or potential indicators. Positive indicators, um, those mean that decay is present and it's the pretty obvious stuff. It's um, fruiting bodies of fungi like conchs and um, and mushrooms and, uh, and, and that sort of a thing. Uh, any open cavities and any just obviously visibly decaying wood, you know, cat faces, things like that. Uh, Potential indicators, where um, potential indicators are going to um, signal to us that decay may, may be present, and we may just see uh, symptoms or signs, um, some of the stuff we've talked about uh, in class before, but then also ideas of cracks, seams, bulges, and wounds, all sorts of stuff where, you know, something may happen right here, as well as um, certain insects like uh, like carpenter ants or um, birds and bees that, that want to um, find homes in these um, cracks, seams, um, bulges, and wounds uh, that could that could lead to um, lead to decay as well. So the, those are kind of some of the things we want to take a look at. Uh, we also want to look at our tree's reaction to decay. Slide myself out of the way again. So there's two fundamental strategies that our trees are going to use when they're dealing with decay. So the first one up here is compartmentalization. So if we get a wound, we want to see that our tree is happily sealing that up. Uh, no big deal. It, you know, it loses a part. It seals it up. It compartmentalizes the, the, the stress and the, and the, the problem to right there and then uh, no big deal for the rest of the tree. Um, but then we also, trees will also just kind of grow over wounds. And so we can see there was obviously a problem down here with this tree um, at some point in time, and we, it just kind of grew right over it and just kind of covered it up and said, you know, we're just gonna push forward and kind of keep going. So those are um, 
two reactions will see uh, two decay. And, we, and if we see those, we know the tree's pretty healthy and um, the tree can can help itself out. And we know that we've got a, a good um, a tree with high vitality um, that's that's still doing pretty well. If we see this not happening and, and the cracks staying open or, or the seams or whatever it is, that's when you um, really want to start worrying about um, possibilities of decay and what's going on in the tree. Um, in terms of risk assessment and management, now it really comes down to the idea of of how are we going to think about this and and what are we going to um, what are we going to um, do? So in terms of risk management, our goal is to balance risk levels against time and money. Um, there's other other ways to kind of think about it, but really what what is the risk of us doing something versus how much is it going to cost and and how much time is it going to cost? So we, we really want to make sure we inspect trees well. We really want to identify what we can do to reduce the risk. And then we want to take action. We want to make sure that we if we need to do it, we, we do it and we do it swiftly and so that it's done when it needs to be done. Um, there's three basic tree inspection levels. Um, we talked about the idea of um, visual assessment. So there's um, you can do a, a limited visual assessment where you just look at it. Um, the visual assessment that we talked about before, that's more level two, your basic assessment. So your ground level uh, inspection where you're, you're walking around the tree and you're really looking it out and maybe even taking a, a soft rubber mallet and kind of sounding out the tree, seeing if there's any um, decay that we can pick up on easily. And then level three, advanced assessment. So you might, um, climbing might be involved or, or all sorts of different diagnostic equipment. The book um, describes all sorts of different um, methodologies that might be used in terms of um, doing a more advanced assessment. But with those advanced assessments, you, you've got to, if you're going to be using these advanced tools, you really have to understand how they work and how to interpret the data that you get from them. So what, what would we consider our minimum standard if we're going to um, really feel comfortable about going out there and, and sizing something up for, for the, the risk? And that's, um, is, that's our visual inspection where we're going to go and look at everything about the tree, 360 degrees around it, make sure we're really good with it. We're also going to, we're going to look at that condition of the tree, but we're also really going to focus on the site, the, the weather conditions and weather patterns. Um, that that exist for the area. We're going to take images of the tree so that we've got a record of what it looked like at this point when we did the um, when we did the uh, inspection. We're going to use an assessment form to make sure that there is a minimum standard that we're that we're following, and that that it's got different questions that we have to answer to make sure that we've kind of covered all of our bases. Um, so we're going to, you know, on that form should be stuff like size, location, description, surrounding and events, potential targets, history of the area. And I've attached um, here, uh, if you want to pause the video and take a look, you can do that now. But this is the assessment form um, that the uh, International Society of Arboriculture, or ISA, our um, governing body, this is the um, basic tree assessment form that they have. And so here's um, here's a, a rating system um, used by ISA where you've got a likelihood uh, matrix and then a risk matrix, and then you can combine those two scores to um, kind of determine um, your risk assessment and, and um, how quickly you should act on something as well as um, what what um, what do you need to do because one thing you really want to think about is the idea that um, every your your choices are everything from you don't have to do anything to we might have to remove this whole tree and anything in between there the, all those choices are all valid depending on what we come up with and what we see in terms of our rating and how we rate it and how we view it and so it's really important to just get comfortable with this process and do it a bunch and start thinking about it and even with trees that aren't um, doing bad necessarily but looking at all trees when you look at it every time you go up to a tree whether you're just trying to figure out what species it is or just look at um, maybe the fruit or whatever of the trees maybe also sit there and, and think about well what could affect this tree how what if this tree started to have a problems what kind of problems would it have and why would it have those problems so that we can just get comfortable when we have to do 
um, risk assessments. Um, just be more comfortable with that idea of, of looking at the tree and coming up with these um, likelihoods and, and risk ratings. So remember, um, the idea of mitigation. So mitigation is the process of reducing failure potential. So um, we want to, uh, we, if we have to intervene, we want to um, intervene and intervene in the best way. Pruning is a primary recommendation. Uh, other recommendations you might see are um, support systems, which we talked about, all that, all that stuff, cabling, guying, propping um, in, in previous chapters. Uh, target removal, right? Either, you know, uh, maybe we can, by, by using fences or putting up signs or, um, you know, diverting a road, um, then we can eliminate the target. And remember, if there's no target, there's no risk. Um, all of our mitigation options should include some sort of monitoring uh, and monitoring on an inspection cycle where we continue to check on a, on an annual or weekly or whatever we deem appropriate basis so that we can um, make sure that that um, that the problem's not getting worse because if it's getting worse we may have to change and reevaluate and one of the other things we want to think about with mitigation is trying to not fix the tree by if we find decay to not remove decay because we might just cause more injury than we're actually preventing. Um, but the biggest thing that we can do for any of these trees is to ensure favorable growing conditions. So even if this tree is having real problems and it's got decay and all of these issues that we're concerned about, the biggest thing we can still do is put um, favorable growth conditions out there because if if the tree's got any vitality to it then let's let's help it out let's nurture it let's give it what it needs and maybe it will then either compartmentalize or grow over or uh, or support itself and if the tree can do it itself that's always going to be the best option for us and then the last part of this whole idea of um of tree assessment and our tree care and, and risk assessment is the idea of uh, liability and negligence. So arborists uh, must exercise due diligence in inspecting and caring for clients' trees. So that's called duty of care. So we have a duty of care where we must exercise due diligence in inspecting and caring for our clients' trees. That's if we're taking on that job, then, then we have assumed a duty of care. The opposite of a duty of care is negligence, and negligence is the failure to exercise due care. And we want to avoid negligence at all um, at all costs, because if you um, if you are negligent, then then you can be liable for something. And if you're liable for it, that means you have the legal responsibility for it, which means you might be the one um, having to pay for whatever damages. Um, might happen and that comes down to an interpretation of standard of care and standard of care is defined as the degree of care that a reasonably prudent person should exercise in the same circumstances so the I, that is obviously debatable and that's why we have a whole legal system but we want to um we want to be able to just say that we did exactly what we should be doing because this is our training and this is what we understand that we should be doing and we do it every single time so that we don't get accused of negligence. Um, one of the big things though with liability though is we aren't responsible for acts of God. Um, now acts of God are defined as an occurrence due to natural causes that could not have been prevented by ordinary skill and foresight. So um, yes, if a hurricane comes through and wipes out a bunch of trees, there's not much we can do about it. But there's also going to be the idea of, did you know that hurricanes uh, happen in this area? And did you know that it's possible that the whole thing um, gets wiped out, right? If you have, let's go back to one of those pictures before where it's the trees by the um, by the river or the lake. If there's a if there's a flood, did you know it was possible that a flood could happen? Well, yes, I knew that it was possible for a flood can happen, and these are the different things that we have talked about with the with the property management or or different things that we had worked out if a, a flood had happened. But you know, this flood was you know whatever a thousand year flood, and um, you know there was even the the mitigation methods that we had there was nothing we could do if you can say stuff like that then you prove that you're not negligent you've proved that you're you've um, exercised your duty of care you've, you've thought about it you you had a plan all those sorts of things if we're using our tree assessment forms if we're taking pictures if we're really making sure we do a thorough uh, assessment every single time if we're using all of our training and skill we can we're definitely going to 
um, avoid negligence, but it's something to be uh, cognizant of and something to really um, try and understand that we do have a duty if we're going to um, take on clients and, and work for them. So just making sure we're good on that. And that is all I got for you.